let us pray. Father, I want to thank you for the opportunity in your presence. Thank you for always teaching us a word and understanding and giving to us in time past. We're looking up to you this hour that you teach us a word again. Give understanding, transform us, make us better Christians. Thank you, blessed Father, because we know you have answered us. In Jesus' mighty name, we prayed. Amen. You are welcome to today's teaching. My name is Dio Ojo. Today we are going to be looking at can prayers change the economic situation of a nation? Um, this teaching is born out of uh, a video I saw recently where a man of God was commanding dollar to fall. Now, for those of us who are not Nigerians, Nigeria is going through hard times and that's majorly caused by the exchange rate of dollar to naira. So the man was now commanding dollar to fall, that the exchange rate of dollar to naira to fall. Thinking that because God is God, then he can just come around and be tinkling with the exchange rate of a nation and as if that's part of what God does. Now, there are things that God can do that we never do. This world is supposed to run by nature. We did two teachings on that. You can go and uh, watch them about if they are should run by miracle. By miracle means by God. And we did a series too, about four teachings on why Africa is backward. And in that teaching, we said that uh, the earth runs by nature and by God. And we said basically the earth runs by nature. But once in a while, God can do something and all of that. And we enumerated some of the things that we should expect from God. So because God is God doesn't mean he goes around changing things the way he likes. It doesn't mean he goes around getting involved in everything humanity does. No, he doesn't do that. There are some things God will do sometimes. But he doesn't do always. And that because he does not do them always, he's not expecting us to be calling him to come and do it. He does those things based on his sovereignty. He does those things because maybe he wants to help us. For instance, I heard of... Uh, one man of God in Nigeria called Pastor Yadeboye. He said there was somebody in his ministry that grew taller one day. Now, that that man grew taller doesn't mean that every time somebody is short, he will be praying, I want you to grow taller, grow taller, grow taller. He wouldn't do that. Why? It is a God sovereignty to decide whether somebody should grow taller or not. If you want to grow tall, you are still young, go and eat food that will make you grow tall. And you have too old to grow tall, then you take it that way. That God did it for that man doesn't mean that's what God goes around doing. So he's not expecting us to be praying that somebody should grow taller. Again, I remember there's a controversy recently, not too long ago, about miracle money in Nigeria. And some people, some men of God, we go for administration and be commanding miracle money. No, it doesn't work that way. God doesn't expect us to get money by miracle. So if God in his magnanimity in his um, benevolence, decides to do it for somebody one day. It does not turn to a doctrine that we can come up anytime and be commanding money to come. No, it doesn't work that way. It does not. It has, has God right that I'm prerogative, that somebody needs money, that the means of supplying money for that person is true miracle. He can do that. That's why he's the Almighty. But that doesn't mean he does it all ways. And when we see that, we're not expected to now be commanding money to come. Because the earth is not supposed to be run by money coming miraculously to people. Again, like for instance, Jesus walked upon the sea. A man is not supposed to walk upon the sea. So it doesn't mean now that we should expect that we, when we see sea, instead of going to going over the bridge, we'll go and be walking on the sea. The person will, will sink. So God is constrained by his words. We're not supposed to be expecting that. Because it's God, he can just do and undo. I remember there's this man of God that said one time that um, if Jesus hadn't particularly mentioned Lazarus when he got to the tomb of Lazarus, if he hadn't said Lazarus comfort, if he had just said comfort, all the dead people have woken up. But that will not be correct. Why? Because God has plans. God has the time he wants all dead people to wake up. That's during rapture or after rapture when he wants to judge the earth. So that's to say if Jesus had said that time that 
uh, wake up without mentioning Lazarus, then nothing will have happened. It's either only Lazarus will wake up or nobody will wake up. Why? It can't violate the, the word of God just because it's, Jesus, it's God. Just because it's Jesus. No, God does not violate his own word. It was not the time to bring judgment. It is only through, during judgment that everybody will rise up and stand before the judgment throne. So that Jesus is God doesn't mean he can just come and say, rise up, that everybody will also rise up. No, it's not done that way. Now we need to bring to give us this kind of understanding because that's why those men of God just feel because God is God or because you are somebody, you can just do what you like. You don't subject yourself to rule, to authority. So we say our men of God today, they are not, they are not governed by the law of the Bible. They do, they do what they like because they feel they are leaders. It comes from all these things, thinking that God can do and not do because it's God. Everybody is supposed to subject himself to rules and regulations. Just as God himself is subjecting himself to rules and regulations and law that he himself has shown out. That's why the Bible says, exalt his word above his name. I just want us to know that um, this ad does not run by miracle. And that because God has done something in the past, then that's why it goes around doing. No. It, it, we are not supposed to live by miracle. But in Africa, we are too superstitious. In everything, we call God. In everything, we want God to come in there. There are so many things that are happening on earth that God is not involved at all. Even though he's seen, he's the Almighty, he's seen everything happening, but he's not involved. And even you, you know, so many things around you that you know God is not involved in those things. Uh, like I said in one of my teachings, where was God when, um, what do you call it, when the Americans were taking the African captive and took us into slavery in their nation? Where was God? Didn't he see that, that that's injustice? Why didn't he act? He will never act because it's not a man's word. It's a, I mean, it's not a God's word. It's a man's word. Now, let's see that when God created the earth, let's see what happened and how God wants us to run the heart. At least something that has to do with what we're teaching today. He said, when God created the earth, the Bible says in the book of Psalm 115 verse 16, that he gave it to the children of men. He said, heavens and heavens of the heaven belong to God. The heart has given to children of men. Now, note that he said, given to children of men, not to Christians. That's to say, whether you're a Christian or not, you're part of the people God has given the heart to. Your authority to have your sin on earth is that you're a human being. You don't need to be a Christian. Whether you're a Christian or not, you're part of people God has given the heart to. Now, it is expected that when you give something to somebody, you hand over everything that has to do with that thing to the person. For instance, if you build two houses, and you're giving one to somebody, maybe your friend or your wife or somebody very close to you, you won't keep, if you say you're giving the person completely, you won't keep the document of that away to you. You have to give the person the document. The person, the person has to do change your name. That's to say anything that has to do with that house now belongs to the person. Now, if you have to do something, you need that house for something in the future, maybe you want to uh, use it as a collateral for a loan in a bank, you will have to speak to that your friend. He has to understand and collect the paper and tender in that bank. If he says, for whatever reason, that I was not going to, going to give you that uh, paper, you can't do anything about it. Why? Because you had already given it to him. So the same way when God said he has given it to us, the art, he gave it to us completely. That's to say, we have the right to do whatever we want on it. Now, if you read the book of Matthew chapter 18, verse 18 too, you see, he said, whatever we are bound on earth is bound in heaven. Meaning that for anything to happen at all, it starts with the heart. And once they have said this is what we want, the heaven will accept it. He said, if you buy something on earth, he said, it will be bound in heaven. Meaning, binding here, accepted there. Losing here, accepted there. So it's the heart that decide what will happen. God will only go through us if he doesn't want something to happen. He will have to go through us in his own way to make sure that that's not happen. Because why? This heart belongs to us. And it is just God. He won't wrest something from your hand that belongs to you. He said, just God. The heart belongs to us. And whatever we want, we do with the heart. Then again, we said it in so many of the teachings that we had in the past, that when God created the earth, he divided into nations, institutionalized leadership so that we'll be ruled by leadership. Let's see what God expects leadership to be doing on earth in our time. Matthew 22, verse 21. Let's start from 20. And he said unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then said he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar, and unto God the things which are God. 
Now, they, you know this story. They asked God if they should pay Caesar. They asked Jesus Christ if they could pay tax. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, of course, bring to me. He, he asked them to bring a coin, and they brought it to him. And he eventually said, give unto Caesar what is Caesar, and give unto God what is God. Now, if you look at that, he's putting God at the same level with Caesar. He said, give unto God what is God, give unto Caesar what is Caesar. Putting God at the level, putting Caesar at the level of God. Meaning that there's some things that Caesar can act as God over. And who is Caesar? Caesar is the leadership. Caesar was the ruler of the Roman Empire at that time. So it was signifying rulership. It was signifying leadership. So when God said, give unto Caesar what is Caesar, give unto God what is God, he's saying that give unto leadership what is leadership, give unto God what is God. Meaning that there are some things that God can act on, Caesar cannot act on them. There are things also that Caesar can act on, God is not supposed to act on them, putting them at par, at the same level, that Caesar is like God. And what does he say? Caesar is God over the earth. So if you have your government in a nation, that government is like God over that nation. So that decisions that that government will take that is final before man and before God. And that's why we must be careful who we elect into places of authority. That's to say that to run the heart, it belongs to Caesar. It doesn't belong to God. Even though God is the one that created the heart. Like I said earlier, he has given it to man. So the man that has given it to now in a way is the leadership, is the government. So the work of God now for the people is to be done by leadership, by the government. So whatever belongs to leadership now, we don't take it to God. You remember the story of when uh, somebody was asking, I think uh, the rich man, story of rich man Lazarus in heaven, the one in hell, one in heaven, Lazarus is in heaven, in paradise, then the rich man in hell. The Bible says he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham and asked Abraham to allow uh, Lazarus will go to the earth and warn his people not to do what he did so that they will not come to where he came to. They will not come to her. And Abraham answered him. He said, no. There are people there. Moses are there. Let them listen to Moses. What's that saying? There are questions that are meant to be answered on earth, not in heaven. There are things that God has put in place that he, he, the earth should deal with that heaven does not have anything to do about it. So when it comes to questions like that, the answer to it is on earth, not in heaven. So the same way, there are solutions to problems that God has given to Caesar, not in God's hands. So if Caesar does not do it, too bad. That's, that's, a, that's a problem of Caesar. God does not have anything to do about it. Now, having said that, let's now look at what we can pray for. I've only realized that some of the things that happens on earth should be controlled by Caesar. Why others were controlled by God? So the one to be controlled by God now is the one who can pray for. The one that is controlled by Caesar should be handled by Caesar. Let's see how to now pray, having that understanding. One, since the heart is handed to leadership, and the leadership is almost a power with God, so to say, so to say, it means that whatever the leadership does, the government does, it will determine the well-being of that nation. If we need to pray to God now for that nation to move forward, that means the prayer we pray is to pray for the leadership of that country, to pray for the government of that country to do the right thing. Because why? That place is meant for the leadership to do, not God. So if we must pray to God for something to be done rightly, and that is supposed to be done by Caesar, by leadership, the prayer must be that God should help the leadership to do the right thing. Not that we'll be telling God to come and do that thing for us, because that thing is supposed to be done by the leadership. Let's see 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that in authority, that we may lead quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. If you look at this verse 2, it's saying that if you want to live a peaceable and uh, a peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, then we must pray for Caesar. We must pray for government to do the right thing. He said, if we don't pray for them to do the right thing, there's nothing God can do about it. We will not live a peaceable and live a life that is honest with all godliness. If we must have that, our prayer must be to government, not, not to God to come and do it for us. You, you notice, he did say that we should pray to God that uh, we should be able to live peaceable and uh, and uh, 
a peaceable li quiet and peaceable life in not God and I say no he said we should pray that Caesar Caesar is the one to handle this not God so if we must pray about it it's Caesar that we are going to pray that God should help Caesar to do it so for a country to experience peace, for a country to allow us to practice our religion, to, for a country to, to ensure that uh, there's honesty within the people, there's transparency, there's uh, openness, like I said here, he said honesty, there's openness, there's integrity, he says it's government that will make sure that they do the right thing. So we should ask that government should do the right thing, put the right policies in place so corruption will not continue in the nation. So that the nation will move forward, there will be peace in the nation. So that there will not be kidnapping, there will not be, uh, what do you call it? Uh, yahoo Yahoo, for those of us who are in Nigeria. There will not be ritual killing, there will not be courtesy, there will not be banditry and all of that. That if we want to have peace, we should pray that sister should do the right thing. Leadership should do the right thing. Say, pray for kings that you should do the right thing. So you don't just start saying, God do this, God do that. No, pray. So that is to say that if you don't put the right person in leadership, you will not be able to get the right thing. If you put the right people in leadership, you will not even need to pray because you will do the right thing. That's why there are things they don't pray for in the Western world. They don't pray for food because the government provides all those things for them. They don't pray so much for security. Government provides all those things for them. But in Africa, we will pray for food, we will pray for security, expecting God to drop food from heaven for us, expecting God to send angels to come and be fighting war for us. It doesn't go that way. You might tell me, uh, God did that in the in, uh, Old Testament for people of Israel. When time comes, we'll look at what Israel means today. So, if you want to have peace in your nation, if you want to, you don't want to have a security challenge in your nation, you want to have a nation where you can practice your religion well, where there is no corruption, pray that Caesar does the right thing. When I say Caesar, I'm talking about government. Pray that the government does the right thing. Let's see Proverbs 29 verse 2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bear a rule, the people mourn. So if people want to rejoice now, what they should do is not pray to God. Go and put the right people in authority. It's very clear here. He said when the righteous are the people rejoice. But when the wicked people are there, he said there's going to mourn. If we look at the country called Israel, the nation called Israel in the Old Testament, every time they had the right leadership, it was always well with the people. Every time they had the wrong leadership, it was always bad with the people. So it's all about leadership. That's why the Bible said, give unto Caesar what is Caesar, give unto God what is God. Some things are, are, are done by Caesar. It's his responsibility of Caesar to do them. It's not God's responsibility. And if Caesar is not doing it, the best we can do is to have God to give Caesar wisdom. Is to have God to help Caesar to do it. Not that we should expect God to come and do those things for us. Now, that's number one. What we can pray for. We say we can pray for peace. I mean, we can pray that God will help Caesar. That's what we just look at. Then two, we can pray against things beyond man, beyond leadership, beyond government. Like I told you, I said in that teaching that you did earlier, we said there are two forces that rule there, the force of God, the force of nature. So we have looked at nature means handed over to Caesar. Caesar, Caesar takes care of that. It runs by government. That's part of nature. Why there are things that are beyond man to do. So, if something is beyond man to do now, we can pray for that. If, if a country is experiencing something that is beyond nature, that is beyond God, I mean beyond man, we can pray to God to help us do that. Like, for instance, we're experiencing natural disaster, like we see in the Western world. We can ask God to do that for us because Caesar or government does not have anything it can do about natural disaster. There, there's no way they can stop it. The best they can do is what they are doing in America or in the Western world, they can alleviate the suffering of the people. They can give us a prior warning that this also is going to happen. They can make us prepare ahead, but they cannot stop it. So that now we can pray. That's the way we can pray and God will take care of those things for us when there's natural disaster or war or pestilence. We can pray uh, against those things. So what are the things? Let's look at quickly at the things that we don't pray for, the things that we don't pray for concerning a nation. We don't pray for exchange rate to crash. Like I said, that's the work of Caesar. I don't think I need to explain that one again. Because Caesar has been given the wisdom to rule the nation. That's a physical thing. So it's a, it's a thing that has to do with nature. So it, it's, it's handed over to Caesar to do. So God is not expecting us to call upon him to ask that we should crash the dollar. But we can pray to God to give Caesar the wisdom, to give the government the wisdom to know what to do. Or to put the right policy in place. 
that will cause it to crash. But we cannot tell God and say, dollar crash in the name of Jesus. We can't say that. Because it is a thing that they handed over to government. Now, another thing, we can't pray for a, a change in the economy situation of a nation. We can't pray for that. That's the work of Caesar. And I don't think I need to explain that too. We, we don't pray also for the prices of commodity to fall. It's government policies that are going to do that. So we don't say, we want, Father, let the prices of commodities go down. We don't do that. We don't do that. We don't pray. I, I saw one light up by one man of God talking about unemployment. And uh, uh, in that prayer, they say, Father, let the rate of unemployment go down. It's not the work of God. It's the work of government, Caesar. Caesar in the place of God for humanity. So anything that's been handed over to humanity, it is Caesar that will do it. That's government. It's not God. If you want God to do it, then cry to God to help Caesar. So Caesar developed the wisdom to know what to do, the right policy, put it in place. So we don't pray to God for unemployment in the nation to disappear. No, it's the work of, of, of the government to do the right thing, put the right policy in place. Then we don't pray to God to alleviate the hardship of people. We, we don't pray that. That might sound funny to you. No, it's not the work of God. It's a policy of government that will decide that. So if you pray for now till tomorrow, nothing will happen. I saw a video uh, circulating on social media about a uh, Nigerian organizing prayer for Nigeria as far back as 1985, asking that God come to their rescue because Nigerians are suffering. Now, 1985 to date is about, um, how many years is that? 15, 15 plus 14. That's um, 39, right? So 39 solid years will be crying for God to come and help us. He has not come to help us. Within that time, we've seen nations risen without praying to God. So it's God so wicked that nations that don't know him are rising and we are going down, keep praying. Why? Because it's not the work of God to, to, to alleviate your suffering. It's the work of Caesar. It's the work of government. Right policy is what they need. If you pray for nothing tomorrow, nothing will happen until government does the right thing. Or we can pray for government to... To, to God to help government do the right thing. Never the level though we can pray for God to help government do the right thing. If you don't put the right leadership in place, there's limit to what God can do when you put the wrong person there. It's only when the person has the, the capacity that you can ask God to help the person. Somebody who is, or maybe for instance, somebody is a thief, is corrupt. You're asking God to help him to rule the country. How is God going to do that? God is not going to do that. The best God can do for you, people, if you pray that is when the next person is coming, let him be the right person. But God to come and somebody who's already corrupt, say, God, don't let this man be corrupt. Mm. God does not go against our mind. The person has chosen to be corrupt, and God cannot force him not to be corrupt. So, like I said, the man of God was praying that uh, the hardship of Nigeria, God should come and help us. Let's see what the people of God did in the book of. Acts chapter 11, when there was going to be a ship. Acts chapter 11, verse 27 to 30. And in, this, in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, note that. And there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be great death throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. There was going to be a problem, there was going to be famine in the land, as prophesied. Prophesy by the prophet. Let's see the answer they provided for that problem that was coming. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwell in Jerusalem. So their decision was not that they should gather themselves and be praying that God help us in this problem. God help. No. Whether we like it or not, no matter how hard it is, some people will prosper in that hard time. Like we saw in the book of Genesis, I think chapter 26, where in the midst of famine, I see prospered. Some people will prosper. God is expecting that those who have enough will take care of those who are poor. That's what God is expecting. And when we begin to do that now, I said in one of our teaching, God will be motivated to want to raise more people who will bless among us. Verse 30. Or let's read again from 29. Then the disciple, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto brethren which dwelt in Judah, Judea, which also they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Now, if we look again in the book of Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 2, you see situation or hardship in the nation of Israel at that time 
to the extent that people needed to be selling their property to give to others who were having needs in one area or the other. They didn't go around praying. They didn't go around fasting. This is hardship. Hardship is dealt with by Caesar. It's dealt with by government. It's dealt with by humanity, not by man, not by God. All that God is expecting is of to put the right wisdom, to put the right answer, to know the right thing to do. So, the church of old, they knew what to do. They didn't go saying, let us go and be praying, God solve our problem, this actually let you go that No. You remember the story of Joseph too, when there was going to be hardship in Egypt. He didn't advise uh, Pharaoh to, to gather men and be praying. No, he didn't tell. Well, if it were our day now, they would have been gathering people and be praying. No, do the right thing. Save when you have abundance. So that when there is going to be lack, you have surplus to deal with that situation. Wisdom is what is needed, not prayer. So there are times we need wisdom, not prayers. Now, so what we're saying is that um, when there are lacks in nations where there is hardship, prayer is not the answer. It's the right thing, right policy, right decision. Then what people are doing also to alleviate the problem, those who have surplus, that will matter, not praying. Uh, we also saw within the time that we'll be praying in Nigeria, for instance, we see, we've seen nations grow. We've seen Singapore. We've seen Singapore grow without praying. They don't know Jesus. Yet they grew by doing the right thing. We've seen Dubai. They have grown by doing the, China has grown by doing the right thing without knowing God. In fact, if we talk about God in China, they will kill you. Yet they grew. But we, we kept praying for 39 years now. Nothing has happened. Why? Because it's not the way to solve such problem. That problem is given to humanity to solve. Give unto Caesar what is Caesar. Give unto God what is God. What again do we not pray for? We don't pray for change of leadership. We're going to look at that teacher also. You don't pray for change of leadership. I know that one is one of the most misunderstood two teachings of the Bible. God, we saw it clear out in Nigeria in the last election where church got involved in election, when church said this is what God wanted, when church did not manner of things, as if God wants to select government for us. Even without me going to the teaching, from what we have said today now, you can know that it's not God to be choosing leadership for people. But we're going to look at the teaching critically, you see it yourself, that it's not God that chooses for people who will rule them. The heart belongs to man. It will be unjust for God to be choosing people for us when the heart belongs to us. That's unjust. And our God is not unjust. Another thing we don't pray for. I, I see this one is very common. Very common. I know this one you may argue it. You may argue it. But where I will try and deal with it, the little way I will deal with it because of time. But if you are the one that want to learn, you will see what we are saying. We see praying in Nigeria, for instance, now. Saying, God, we have sins. Because we have sins. Our sins that brought it upon us. That's not true. We sin. We sin. It's not sin that's brought upon anybody. It's not because of sin that anybody is suffering. Now, we're going to look at that. What do I mean? But before I go into looking at that, you see that some of the nations I mentioned earlier, they have seen more than Nigeria, yet they are prosperous. So if it is a sin that is making some nation not to go forward, even America that is prosperous, they shouldn't go forward. If you know what they did to the black people in America, you know that they don't deserve to be prosperous. The wickedness, you know that they will, they will tie people to, to a tree and put fire under them like you are roasting an animal. And yet, they were prosperous. Because it has nothing to do with God. Anyway, we're, we're going to do a series of teachings to, to balance off some of these things. Uh, we see also even in, uh, in Africa today, Rwanda. Rwanda is making progress little by little. Is it because of prayer? No. They've even gagged the church in Sudan today. I mean, in Rwanda today. They've restricted the operations of the church in Rwanda. Yet, they're prosperous. They're doing better. Why? So if it is sin, Rwanda shouldn't progress. Because they are restricted to the church. They are doing things that is not expected of God in a way, and yet they are prosperous. We see China. You talk about Jesus Christ in China, they will kill you. And yet they are prosperous. So if it is sin, China is sinning more than us. The greatest sin anybody can commit is not to accept Jesus Christ. There is no sin that is greater than that. And so if there are nations that don't even believe in Jesus at all, and they are prosperous, and you are saying sin that is making Nigeria backward, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. If we believe that the Christian church, I mean the Christian religion is the religion God has given to us, it, it goes to say that any nation that doesn't believe in Jesus Christ shouldn't prosper at all. And you know quite a number of them that are doing far better than those of us who call ourselves Christians. Now, 
this confusion comes from two things. I'm going to look at it very quickly because of time. It comes from misunderstanding of Old Testament and how God operated uh, in Old Testament, how he dealt with the nation of Israel. Now, there are two sets of nations in Old Testament. There's Israel, there's a nation called Israel, then there are other nations. Now, let's look at other nations first. Other nations were those nations that are not that have nothing to do with Israel. So every nation that is not Israel at that time, God had nothing to do with them. God was only interested in Israel. He took Israel to himself. He said, Israel is, is his own inheritance. There is people. So every dealing God had in the Old Testament was about Israel, not about any other nation. So God had nothing to do with other nations except the nations that ran Israel. And God had something to do with nations around Israel because they, 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 they had something to do with Israel. Like if you look at the book of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, you see that God punished some nations around Israel. Why? Because of how they behaved to Israel. Not because they were nations that committed sin. So, if you look at the book of uh, um, Ezekiel 28, 2-5, let's look at it quickly and see that nation prospered, even in the Old Testament, without knowing God, without God having anything to do with them. Ezekiel 28, 2 5. Ezekiel 22 to 5 says, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyros, Thus said the Lord God, because thy heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit at the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man. And not God, thou, though thou set thy heart as the heart of God. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no respect that there is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding, thou art gotten thee riches, and art gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. Five the last verse. By thy great wisdom and by traffic, as thou increased thy riches. And thy heart is lifted up because of thy riches. You see there that this nation Tyros was rich even though they didn't know God. This nation was rich and yet did not know God. So no testament, if you look at the book of Acts chapter 14, or should we look at that? So that um, let, let's look at Acts chapter 14. Let's bring something out there. Acts chapter 14, I think verses 14 and 15. Let me see it. At 14. And saying, Sir, why do you these things? Why also are men, we are also a men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities into the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sin and all things that they are in. Note that. Paul talking to uh, some people here say, God made heaven and earth. These people don't believe in God, they were serving idol. Now, verse 16. Who in time past suffer all nations to walk in their own way. In time past, God permitted nations to do what they liked without having anything to do with them except Israel. Why? Israel belonged to him. So, nations could do whatever they like. They commit sin. It didn't bother God. That's their problem. They didn't commit sin. It didn't bother God. That's their problem. If they did the right thing, they prospered. I, I think that should be in verse 17. Let's see verse 17. Okay, verse 17. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful season, filling our heart with food and gladness, telling them that God feed their heart, he gave them fruitful season. So God allowed nation to prosper even though they were committing sin, even though they didn't believe in God. God had nothing to do. Immediately, man had a problem with God. At least that is Adam had a problem with God. Man left humanity to himself. Allowed the heart to run by nature. Prosper if you lie. If you lie, don't prosper. That's a problem. Then began with Abraham to carve out a people for himself. Abraham then up to Israel. So Israel was the only one that belonged to God in the, those days. Every other nation didn't belong to God. They were doing whatever they wanted, like we have seen here. God permitted them to do whatever they wanted. So they could commit sin and still make it. It didn't bother God. Now, somebody will now tell me that, hey, but God destroyed some nations. Let's see why God dealt with some nations. Like I said earlier, some of those ones that were around Israel, because of their dealing with Israel. For instance, you say, you mock Israel when I was dealing with Israel. You, you invaded Israel. God will deal with them. But apart from nations that have something to do with Israel, God had nothing to do with nobody. Let's see um, Genesis chapter 15. Verse 13 to 16. 
unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Mark that. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. It's going to judge nation. Why? Because Israel, the service. So it was dealing with nations that time, they had issue to do with Israel. But any nation that had nothing to do with Israel, like we in Africa, yeah, they were not around that area of Middle East, it didn't bother God what we're doing with our lives. And thou shalt go, verse 15, thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall come either again. For the nuclear to Amorite is not yet full. Note that. Iniquity Amora is not yet full. Now, in those days, what God was doing with those countries, those countries, they could come in and they would prosper. There was no problem with that. But there's a there's a red line that they, they must not cross. There's a level of sin they must not commit. If they commit that level of sin, God was going to deal with them. That's why I said there is that this nation is committing sin, no. But the sin they committed is not enough for me to interfere in what that nation was doing. You see, if I look at it as Almighty God, I've seen, I've projected, I've seen into the future, and I've seen that you take them from there, you have to reach the level of sin that can deal with. Even up to today, this is happening. I am planning to do a teaching on, uh, on uh, um, the limit of mercy and grace of God, like I've taken God granted today. There's a level of sin we commit that God will come and act. Before we get to that level, God will leave us. You can do what you like. You won't bother him. You are your own. It doesn't stop you. That's a problem. He's expecting that you will repent and change. Not the same way you have a son who is misbehaving and that son is misbehaving and you're expecting that that son is going to change little by little. You allow him. You're still giving him food. You still allow him to come home. You still pay school fees. But the level of of uh, recalcitrancy or misbehavior of that child that you almost want to disown him. So the same way, there's a level of sin that man will commit, even though we are saved, we are born again, that God will say, no, you are past the boundary, you are crossed the red line. So the same way in those Old Testament too, God left them on down to do what they wanted, those nations. But there's a red line, there's a level they will get to that God said, I must act. This is beyond what I expected for humanity. That's what happened to Sodom. Don't forget, it was not when Sodom and Gomorrah started doing homosexuality that God destroyed them. It reached a level before God destroyed them. The same way, this Amorite now, the nations that God collected their land, gave it to Israel. God said, I can't deal with them now, even though they are committed sin. He said, their sin now is not yet full. It will be full in 400 years' time. You can see how long globe God gave them. That means they must have been committed sin for hundreds of years, more than 400 years. He said, 400 years from the time God was talking, was the time that sin was going to be full. So, God does not deal with a nation because it's committed sin. That's why China can prosper. That's why, uh, what do you call it? Other nations can, pro uh, can prosper and yet they don't know God. Because it's not God's business to have anything to do with any nation or to deal with nation because of their sin. How did God deal with Israel? God dealt with Israel as a nation. God dealt with Israel as a church. Now, what is a church? Church means people of God. That's the meaning of church. those of us who are giving our life to Christ. Then we are called the people of God. So the same way, Israel was a, like a church to God, even though it was a nation. I'm going to take a teaching on that too. And we'll look at it critically. So we understand how we should read New Old Testament. Because there are some things in the Old Testament that God was dealing with Israel as a, as a church, not as a nation, as a people that belong to him. So when you read such things, you don't read it as if that's how God will behave to any nation now. No, it's the way he behaves to his own people, the church of today. You will have read in somewhere around Acts chapter 17. I said it talked about Acts 7 or Acts 7, that church in the wilderness. So Israel at that time was a church to God, a prototype of the church of today, at the same time, a prototype of the nation. So when you look at Old Testament reading, you must read it in context. Is God talking to them as a nation? Is God talking to them as a of, of God called church? Let's see Galatians 6:16. Galatians 6, 16 say, it says, And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be unto them, and mercy upon the Israel of God. So the church, the Israel of that time, the church of today, the church of today is the Israel of that time. So when God was dealing with Israel, most time he was dealing with them as his own people, as a church, not as a nation. We must understand that. Uh, you see where I'm going to with what I'm trying to say. 
Now, let's look at Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 and 6. Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Please follow me. We're going to go and read first. I mean, First Peter 2.9.2. Let's bring something out. You see the similarity. He said, Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my command, then you shall be a peculiar treasure, not that, unto me above all people, for all the earth is my a peculiar treasure. Now, see verse 6 again. It says, And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. Not that kingdom of priests. We've seen peculiar people. we say kingdom of priests. Then again, say, And our only nation. He said, These are the world which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Now, God had told us in verse 5, verses 5 and 6, that peculiar people unto him, a holy nation, a holy nation unto him, a great kingdom of priests unto him. First Peter 2, 9. He said, but here a chosen generation, not that. Everything he said in Exodus that we read is the same thing is repeating in this first Peter, chapter 2, verse 9. Don't forget that I was talking to Israel in that one. This one now is talking to the church of today. You now see that the church of today is the same thing as Israel of that time. He said, but here a chosen generation, the same thing told them. A royal priesthood, the same thing told them in the Exodus that we read. A holy nation, the same thing told them that uh, uh, Exodus that we read. A peculiar people, he told them the same thing too. If you remember, we read it in that Exodus chapter uh, 19. That you should show forth the praise of him who will call you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So what are you trying to say here? The Israel of Old Testament is the church of today. The church of today is the history of that time. What God was just trying to do was to carve the people for himself and teach them what he wanted human beings to do that belongs to him. The history of that time belonged to God. That was the same way the church of today belongs to God. So the dealing of God with the history of that time is the same dealing that he has been with the church today, people that belong to him. Even though that one was a shadow, so it wasn't a complete dealing. But we are having the complete dealing now. So the Israel was a people of God, just like the church is a people of God today. When we now read the Old Testament, we must read it in context, put in perspective the fact that the Israel of that time was both a nation and a church. So some of the dealings God had with them was as a church, not as a nation, even though we think it was dealing as a nation. So we don't just leave something for Old Testament and bring the New Testament and think that's how God deals with nations. No. Don't forget what's also said how God dealt with other nations of that time, nations that didn't belong to God. Now, what are we trying to bring out of here? The dealing of God with uh, uh, nations of that time was as far God had nothing to do with them. So if they were hearing, they were doing something wrong, God didn't bother about them. Now, when their sin was full, God dealt with them. We know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. God, we never had record that God warned them. What God did was to deal with them when he felt that they passed the boundary, they crossed the red line. Same thing with the one we read in the book of uh, Genesis chapter 15. God said it was going to take 400 years for their sin to be full. He never warned them. He never told them anything because God had nothing to do with humanity after Adam except the people of Israel that he cast to himself. And we have read it again in that uh, art that he left nations to do whatever they like. Let them prosper. Let them do what they like. They are committed sin. They are their own. But when the same passed the level, he didn't expect of humanity, he would deal with them. Like he dealt with people of Canaan, Canaan in Exodus that we read, I mean in Genesis that we read, and dealt with people of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, why the Israel was dealing there as his own people is the just church today? So, anywhere you see God dealing with Israel as to dealing with them unto repentance, they sin, he wanted to correct them. Is as dealing with your son or dealing with the people that belong to you, you want to correct so that they can come back to you. But the dealing with other nations was different. It wasn't correcting them. Let, let's see what the Bible is saying in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verse 1 to 5. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply, and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness, to humble thee and to prove thee, to know that, to know what was in thy heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandment or not. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knowest not, neither did thou fathers know, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man does not live by bread alone, 
but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Thy raiment wax not old upon thee, neither did thy foot soil these forty years. Now, note this verse 5. Thou shalt also consider in thy heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. So, the dealing of God with people of Israel was as son, was as his own people, that he could correct and expect them to listen to correction and come back to himself. So, he's dealing with them, he's, uh, he's dealing with them when they say was unto repentance or for correction purpose, so that they can be better people that belong to him. Don't forget the one we read, like we said, in the one or other nations, it wasn't dealing with the unto correction, it's to the condemnation, because they didn't belong to him. Let's see again, Exodus chapter 4, verse 27. It says, And the Lord said, to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and met him in the mount of God and kissed him. Sorry, I got it wrong. Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus said the Lord, Israel is my son, not that, even my firstborn. So the dealing of, of God with Israel was as his own people, as son, as, as his inheritance, as people that belong to him, that he could correct and instead them to get better so that he could bless them. Why the dealing with other nations was unto condemnation, that these are human beings, they've seen no redemption for them, they do anything wrong, I watch them, if they pass a certain level, I deal with them. Or, like I said, the ones that were co close to Israel that time, because of the interaction with Israel, whether for good or for bad, God used to deal with them. But other nations that were not know Israel, around Israel, God never had anything to do with them. Now, why are we saying this? The point we are trying to make is that when you now read Old Testament, you read it in perspective, that this thing you are reading, that these people sin, I dealt with them, they might come back to him, was because they were his own people. So today, the nations of today don't belong to God. What belongs to God is a church. So God does not deal with the nations of today like he was dealing with Israel at that time. God only deal with nations of today like he was dealing with other nations. Because nations don't belong to God. It's the church that belongs to God. So the nations of today are like other nations I taught you. That I said it's unto condemnation. Why the church of today is, is like the Israel, which is unto uh, what do you call repentance or correction. So there are two different things. When you now see a place that people, you read the New Testament, that God was dealing with them, as Israel, you apply that to the church of today. You don't apply it to the nation. Because no nation belongs to God today. As, 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 as this earth is today, no nation belongs to God. The nations, you can say, belong to God. Once upon a time, it was like America when they were still in tune with God. Britain when they were still in tune with God. Europe when they were still in tune with God. So God could deal with them that time when it was almost like a state religion. God could deal with them as, in, as uh, he was dealing with Israel. But today, there is no nation particular we can say they are entirely serving God and they are acknowledged that they belong to God completely. So it's the church that belongs to God. And so every dealing of God, with every nation now, it's like Old Testament. It has nothing to do with them. It has no problem with them. It has no issue with them. They are committing sin. That is a problem. They can commit sin and prosper, like we said with China. They can commit sin and prosper, like we said with uh, with uh, Singapore, that they don't know God. They can commit sin, like America is legalizing LGBTQ and still prosperous. We are not legalizing any LGBTQ and we are not moving forward because it's not about. It's not nation. God has nothing to do with nations. He has something to do with the church. It is the church that God is expected to take over the nation for him. So that with that now, the blessing of God can come upon the nation. If you now read the Old Testament when God is saying he was dealing with Israel as a people, you apply it to church. The church now that is not doing what God wants, like we are today. The church of today is not doing what God wants. And the power of God is no longer with us. I hope you know that. All that you are saying is just, my children, okay, no matter how bad they are, let me feed them. No matter how bad they are, let me shelter them. No matter how bad they are, let me provide for their basic necessities. But the real power of God is no longer with us. That's why we can serve God in people in, in places like Africa, and yet our environment is not changing. If we serve God in truth and in spirit, it will change the heart of our people. Our nations will, come, will become better. So God has no dealing with, uh, with the nations of today. It's only with the church. We can see that again, book of uh, John, John chapter 17, we read verse 9. John 17, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which are given me. For they are mine, no doubt. Jesus was speaking here, standing for God, that he prayed for his own people, the apostles, the people who become Christians, that he was not praying for the world, he's not praying for any nation. So the prayer of God now, the dinner of God now is with the church. So if you say anywhere God is saying, um, the saying in Old Testament, I'm there with them, no. 
is the church is talking about. Like he said, he said, uh, judgment will come, will start with the church because they belong to him. Why the nations, he has nothing to do with them. He said, I'm not praying for the world. That is, I have nothing to do with the world. You remember 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says that uh, the, the, the prince of this world, talking about the devil is the owner of this world. So God has nothing to do with it. That's their problem. God is waiting for the last judgment to deal with people who don't have any, who, who are not born again. It is we that is God's problem. That is God wants to uh, bother himself with. That God wants to worry himself with. Like he said again in the book of Matthew chapter 16. He said, we build the church. It's not building any nation. And that's why when you go to New Testament, entire New Testament, you will not see where they say, pray for nation, think about nation. No, it talks about only God's kingdom and talks about praying for leadership. Because it's the leadership that owns the nation today. It's the leadership that determines the well-being of the nation of today. So it's not, it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's not God. It is only when the church is doing the right thing that God can interfere in what is happening through the church in the nation. What are we trying to say? You cannot say a nation is going down. I mean, the nation has sinned. That's why they are suffering. That's not true. If they have not crossed the red line, God has nothing to do with them. And the only nation that has crossed the red line is unto condemnation, not unto uh, repentance. So if you see a place like Second Corinthians, I mean Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, where the Bible says that uh, uh, if my people are called by my name, we won't put them say, You don't apply that to a, a nation. You apply that to the church. So my people are called by my name. That's the church, not the nation. So if the nation is using that to pray now, that would be wrong. Is it, it is, is the church that is using that to pray where it's people? That if we can change, our society will change. If we can change, our society will be better. We looked at that in that why Africa is backward, part one to four. That the church can change the society. So the dealing of God is with the church and not, uh, uh, not uh, the society. I'm going to draw the curtain here. I've been able to tell us that the church of today uh, is what belongs to God. The nation of today does not belong to God. So the dealing of God with the nations of today is how it deals with nations of old. Why? The way it deals with Israel is how it's dealing with the church of today. And I will also say that it left nations to prosper on their own. It doesn't bother themselves. It, it didn't bother themselves about uh, whether they were practicing sin or not. If God wanted to judge them, it's unto condemnation whether their cup was full. Why? His own people, uh, Israel, they could commit little sin and he would deal with them so that they can be corrected and become better. We have also said that he has handed over now the nation to Caesar, that's the government. So it's the government just the way in Old Testament that time, all those nations were handed to their government to do the right thing for them. So it's handed over to government today. If government doesn't do the right thing, a prayer only can be for government to do the right thing, not for God to come and be helping us. So, and we are enumerated earlier where we can pray and where we cannot pray. I want to draw the curtain there. Thank you, and God bless.